Hey, um, before we get started, just a quick content warning. This episode talks about a device that appears in hospitals and clinics and probably psych wards. So if you have any trauma surrounding those areas and the devices found inside them, you might want to skip this episode. Sorry. Tech Ambrosia. These days, tablet computers are commonplace. From our media, to our boardrooms, to our classrooms, to our drive throughs these low-cost and low-power computers have pretty much cemented themselves into the computer in the real world societal role. And it makes sense. They're lightweight and easy to handle with interfaces custom-tailored to direct human interaction, or sometimes direct animal interaction. The flashiest and most expensive tablets occupy a space in the computing market that was once reserved for back-breaking and battery-chugging desktop replacement laptops, the high end of the market, with premium features and premium price tags. But tablets are just as versatile as the laptops and desktops that came before them. They appear on construction sites, in the hands of insurance adjusters, as portable engineering devices, and humble note-taking note companions. It seems like tablet computers have moved into every conceivable area of our modern lives. If you're at all familiar with the strange shapes that computing can take in our complex world, you'll no doubt recognize the name Panasonic, makers of the long-running Toughbook line of ruggedized laptops and, yes, tablets. Today, we're taking a look at the Panasonic Toughbook CFH1 Health. The doctor will see you now. <laughs> all set? Bottoms up. In 2008, Intel decided that the best place to put its CPUs and chipsets was the world's hospitals, and launched their Digital Health Initiative, aiming to get their then-new low-power atom processors into mobile healthcare devices. In early 2009, they showcased the Intel Health Guide, which was a small touchscreen home health assistant to promote their mobile clinical assistant platform. That same year, this machine launched from Panasonic, the CFH1 Health. The list of features on this machine is extensive. Panasonic touted a fully sealed design, capable of being sprayed with disinfectant and wiped down repeatedly without the hardware so much as batting an eye. The dual hot swappable battery base, as well as the DC charging port, are hidden behind sealed doors, preventing dust and moisture from entering the machine. They included an RFID smart card reader to allow contactless logon to the machine, further reducing the machine's potential as a contact-based vector for disease transmission. Below the screen is a downward-firing barcode reader with matching top handle trigger button for your rapid-fire barcode reading needs. That screen, by the way, is also fully sealed and includes dual digitizers, one a Wacom-style capacitively coupled pen digitizer, and the other a single-point resistive touch layer, allowing it to be used while wearing gloves. The screen itself doesn't look particularly impressive, but is supposed to use a similar technology as the early Game Boy Advance screens and be especially readable in daylight. Readable in daylight. In daylight. <sighs> I'm gonna have to go outside to test this thing, aren't I? So I guess the real question is... Why did you think this is a good idea?
Well, that was disappointing. Uh, let's see if the rest of the features work, hopefully better than that. The one I was the most curious about was the barcode reader, and after much hunting for drivers and installing and reinstalling drivers, seriously, there are so many drivers for the barcode reader, I got it to work. And work it does. Wow. It scans pretty much every 1D barcode I've thrown at it, and it's especially good at scanning UPCs, so this might be a good machine for you if you're into managing your media library by UPC codes. Next up was the camera, and I didn't have particularly high hopes here. It does technically function, I'll give it that. It even has a video light and can autofocus. It also includes Wi-Fi connectivity and Ethernet VGA out and three USB ports when you dock it in its cradle. So, what is it good for? I'll be honest, I have this machine mostly for the novelty. I mean, how often do you see a tablet like this in the real world? It's quite capable of note-taking, and if you load it up with all four batteries, the two hot swappable in the tablet and the two in the charging dock, it'll run for about 12 hours straight. It's pretty mediocre with web browsing. Early atoms struggle with the modern internet, and this fanless single-core Z540 is no exception. This machine uses uh, Intel's earliest low-power chipset for the Atom, codenamed Palsbo, which uses a mobile phone-like PowerVR SGX535 for the graphics chipset. It is technically DirectX 9 compliant, but it's not going to win any performance awards. So, really, what is this thing useful for? I'll be honest, not a whole lot nowadays. It was developed to be a turnkey black box for the healthcare industry, capable of fitting into a sanitary environment and then be disposed of when no longer needed. To that end, it's pretty much stuck in 2009. Windows 7 was the last Windows release to get major driver support for all of its specialty hardware, like the barcode reader and the RFID tag reader. It will technically run Windows 10, but the experience is beyond painful. Even Windows 7 is asking a little bit much of this atom. Linux support is not great. The Palsbo chipset received very poor Linux support from Intel from the get-go, and reverse engineering the SGX535 has been slow going at best, stymied by lack of hardware in the field and, frankly, lack of interest from developers. That's probably the saddest part of the story. Robust Linux support is the entire reason I can daily this single-core Atom netbook from 2010. But this doesn't run Palsbo. It uses Intel's NM10 chipset, which has much better support under all flavors of Linux. It's too bad. This thing has terrific battery life, even today, but because it's a sealed machine, there are zero ports on it unless you dock it, making it pretty useless as an Internet of Things development machine or a remote sensing station. I picked it up because it was inexpensive and it looked like it might be fun to mess around with, and honestly, yeah. I've never interacted with hardware like this on a personal level. I've owned Toughbooks before, but those were traditional ruggedized laptops, and while they were quirky, they weren't this. While I was writing this episode and testing the machine to see what worked and what didn't, and to explore its form factor, I came up with the following phrase which I think sums this machine up perfectly. This thing is a master's thesis in optimizing industrial design for the mundane. It's one of the coolest pieces of boring technology I've ever seen. And I think that's a great place to end it. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Jumper Block, the Panasonic Toughbook CFH1 Health. Be good to each other, and have a great night. It uses a mobile phone-like PowerVR SGX535 graphics chipset. I'm way behind my teleprompter. Read what you wrote. Read what you wrote. Linux support is not great. The Palsbo chipset... Cheapset. <laughs> cheapset. Stomping. Stomping is the order of the day today, apparently. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Jump Jumper Block. Junker, Junker Block. No, it's not. <laughs>